My mother worked in middle school and high schools, cafeterias and campuses, almost since I can remember. She's not a teacher, but she has always been an educator. And even though most of school kids spend their times inside classrooms, I witnessed from an early age how human connection in those 15-minute breaks in between subjects could have a tremendous impact on a child's life and future. Sometimes, in the end of the school year, my mom would come home with a box filled with cards and letters from students that have moved on. The cards talked about how the conversations they had with my mother helped them have better relationships with their parents, follow an unexpected career path, or even that they were now more kind and caring thanks to her. Some of those students, years after those goodbyes, now adults, still pass by my mother on the street and stop her for a hug, sometimes to introduce her to their own children and to reiterate that all of the moments that they shared together helped shape the adults that they are today. I'm telling you all of this, not just because I feel incredibly proud of my mother, but because when I was invited to give this talk, I was questioned on where this idea of working with children in the middle of my PhD come from. And although my answer that day was that, that I just wanted to run away from the frustrations of my research, the real reason is this, is this inspiration potential. You see, I spent so much time watching the impact that my mother had on other children just by talking to them that I realized that children are like hosts of endless potential once we take the time to interact and listen to them. Carl Sagan once said, every kid starts out as a natural-born scientist, and then we beat it out of them. And there are two important messages here. The first is that children are born with all the traits that make an excellent scientist. They question everything, they often experiment, they learn from those experiments, and they are virtually unbiased towards any particular result. Unfortunately, the second part still applies. And in my opinion, we are still not doing enough to foster our little scientists. Because looking back at my personal school journey, and also in schools that I visited during outreach activities, I saw that it's common for us to ask children to compartmentalize their creative, interrogative, and connective thinking in order for them to acquire and memorize scientific content. And although content knowledge is extremely important, it is now widely understood that it cannot be disengaged by the other types of knowledge because it doesn't grant scientific literacy by itself. Children should acknowledge scientific work, not just because scientists or teachers or any other people say they should, but because it's constantly being passed through the process of critical thinking, of questioning. And it's really easy for us to make children forget that making questions, testing hypotheses, be wrong, and question again, is how you create valid ideas. Like pediatrician Dr. Laura Jana once said, it should be more important to ask the right questions than to know the right answers. And children are natural inquisitors, so the sooner and the earliest we expose them to advanced scientific concepts and scientists, the more literate adults they will become. What psychology literature shows is that children as young as four years of age can moderately assess the trustworthiness of an individual when they are choosing in what to believe. Crazy, right? But this gets extremely pertinent if we now look on how children perceive scientists. And in the last few decades, few has changed in that perception. In recent studies, it is still shown that more than 50% of inquired children think of scientists as chemists, lab coats and goggles, mixing chemicals in a lab. And don't get me wrong, chemists are superheroes. But how will a child make a connection between climate change and a chemist? Or between someone that stays in the lab all day and a marine biologist studying plastic pollution in the sea? If we are not constantly exposing kids to different scientists and actively exercising their questioning skills, how will they understand what the job of a scientist truly is about? 
So curiously enough, in the discussion in one of these studies, the proposed solutions for this were better depiction and representation of scientists in the global media, which makes sense, and the clear portrayal of scientific work done by teachers and parents to their children. There was no consideration whatsoever that scientists themselves should actively change this. But I know what you are all thinking now. I mean, but scientists are so busy mixing chemicals together, what can they do? And how can they change the mind of a child? Well, I believe that we can do that by creating interaction moments, by connecting. And if you think that they will be the insecure side, <laughs> think again. <laughs> Because from personal experience, I can tell you that I get more nervous of talking about my scientific work with children than with my peers. Because in an audience of children, you cannot really hide behind complicated graphs or jargon or their inherent lack of expertise. No, you will have to know your science to the core. And this is one of the biggest benefits that you will extract from these interactions. Because once you start routinely doing this, you will get aware of all the possibilities of your work. But now you ask me, but how can we create these interaction moments? So let me tell you what I did here at KAUST, a community where scientists are literally at every corner. So it all started in a timid outreach activity where our local school, the KAUST school, came for a visit at my research center, the Red Sea Research Center. And I was looking into some agar plates from an experiment we have done on the day before, and I was seeing that some of them worked and some of them didn't. But I was ready to just bring the ones that worked to our result discussion session. But I kept feeling that by leaving other results, the negative results out, I was just defrauding them. After all, all scientists know that failure and negative results are as common as caffeine in science. So I still decided to bring those along to try to foment some questioning. And I was amazed by the outcome, in particular by two things. First was the face of perplexion in some of those kids when they realized that science was not working as it should. And the second one was that actually Once we started brainstorming on reasons why it didn't work and what we can do to change it, all of their reasoning and ideas were actually extremely valid. So I went home that day and I thought, how cool would it be to have my scientific work or any researcher's work judged and evaluated by kids and making them part of the creation of knowledge instead of just end consumers of it? So I went home and did, I think, what everyone does every time they think they had a creative idea. I googled it. <laughs> and I quickly realized that I was not that smart after all. Someone already thought about it. But this was okay, because then it meant that there were other people like there thinking like me. And if there were already platforms that I can implement in my community to start the conversation going, I should use them. And so the platform I discovered was a newly developed journal called Frontiers for Young Minds. And Young Minds is a journal that is edited for and reviewed by children. So researchers will rewrite their published and peer-reviewed articles and submit it to the journal. But instead of the article being published as is, it will undergo a review process where children themselves, with the help of a mentor, will mark, correct, and suggest modifications in order to make the work more accessible to other children from 8 to 15 years of age. And let me tell you something. Once the kids get the hang of it, they can be tougher than reviewer number three. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> But in the end of the experience, the researcher gets a new publication and learns how to communicate his work in a better way, while children get acknowledged in press for their work and get a trustworthy piece of scientific information directly from its source. They also become a part of how this once inaccessible scientific work gets incorporated in their scientific understanding. And most importantly, they will learn the peer review process by which all scientific work needs to pass before it gets published and taught to them. So it only took a few months with the help of my supervisor 
for me to contact the editorial office of the journal, create and edit a collection of articles done from my colleagues from the Red Sea Research Center, and where mentorship sessions were done in person by KAUST researchers. I developed a collaboration with our local school, the KAUST school, so we could have an after-class group to do these type of review sessions. And let me tell you, like, the result for authors, mentors, teachers, and kids was amazing. We even got some media coverage. And I was so excited about it, and the kids were so excited about it, that I just wanted to expand and to do more. And so I did. I contacted the social responsibility department of the university, because I wanted to expand these review sessions to kids from other schools in Saudi Arabia that have less resources. And because the journal is currently trying to expand their languages, I am currently trying to develop a network of Arabic-speaking professors, translators, mentors, and students, so we can make all the content we create here accessible to all Arabic-speaking kids. And to be really honest, this is only the beginning for me. Because a lot of things happened in the last year. But maybe the most important one was that I also became a father. So if I was scared before of calling myself an educator, I'm not anymore. Because all of the work I do from now on will not just be for the amazing kids of my colleagues and friends. It's also for my own. Ever heard the term kids planning? You know, like when a kid comes to an adult and tries to explain something to the adult that the adult actually knows much more about than the kid? Well, my goal is that by exposing children from a young age to advanced scientific work, that one day my kid comes home and tells me something about science that I didn't know about. Ideally, every day, I see a world where scientists have an active role on the scientific literacy of children. And once this happens, both sides will benefit, because platforms as the one I showed you, or others you might find, or even create, will place us, scientists, in an active position to influence how our fields of research are perceived by the future adults of this world. That will allow us to put a face on the anonymous scientist living in a child's head. Because scientific literacy is powerful, and it can change an entire community, and even an entire society. One day, that child you interacted with and exposed to your work might be the finest professional or politician with a saying on the funding of scientific work, or a journalist that will report scientific findings in an accurate and unbiased way. Or maybe that literate school worker that didn't follow a scientific career but is still able to inspire your grandkids to think critically and to question their views. So, fellow scientists, leave the lonely lab, bring your lab coats and goggles somewhere else, keep 50% of your madness, but start inspiring. But most importantly, be inspired. After all, we are all born scientists. Thank you.